So Asha, Elon Musk seems to be screwing up Twitter. Is he in any legal trouble? Eh, it's complicated. I'm Asha Rangappa. I'm a former FBI special agent and teach national security law at Yale University. And I'm a legal and national security analyst. And I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down to a soundbite or a tweet. So Asha, Elon Musk, we talked about him last time. He seems to have really screwed up Twitter. I, I don't think he understands exactly what he was buying. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that he messed up was creating this like Twitter blue th uh, feature that basically gave everyone a blue check mark for eight bucks. Not sure what he was thinking there, but you know, Twitter, uh, Twitter was a total mess uh, for a period of time until he put that on hold with all sorts of uh, famous people, companies getting impersonated. Um, I I got followed by uh, George Washington. I know there's all sorts of more colorful, uh, uh, you know, f spoofs and fakes out there that had blue check marks for a period of time. You know, you wrote a piece about this recently. I know we were talking about it when you were in the process of writing. What was what's that about? Yeah, uh, and by the way, God and Jesus also had blue check marks for for a little while. I'm not sure if those are down yet. Um, my piece was really looking at what kind of legal trouble Elon Musk could potentially be in with the Federal Trade Commission. As you know, Renato, he's fired many of his top senior corporate officers. Um, he fi Immediately after taking over the company, he fi fired his general counsel and his chief legal compliance officer. And then he basically fired his whole uh, data and privacy team, <laughs> at least the, the people who had it. And the reason that this is a problem is because Twitter is currently under a consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission. And we can talk a little bit about what that entails, but it involves many onerous requirements in terms of um, reporting and certification of all of their data and privacy um, you know, mechanisms whenever they roll out a new product. And so, especially since he's been making rapid changes since he's taken over the company, um, that creates a problem there, but then also he's basically let go of the people who can ensure that he's complying with this order that he is under. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, so just for everyone listening, what's a consent decree? I think you, we should explain that. So a consent decree is an order from a court that requires the company to basically undergo a series of uh, requirements, whatever that agency it has told them that they have to do. I mean, I think the the actual you know details can vary. Um, what happened with Twitter is that in 2011, uh, the Federal Trade Commission discovered that they had been misusing users' data. And as a result, they investigated and they put Twitter under a consent decree that would require them to go through certain kinds of protocols and reporting, et cetera. Then Twitter violated that consent decree uh, by again misusing uh, their users' data. They were basically taking data that Twitter users were providing to secure their accounts and then turning around and using that to target ads towards them. And so because of this violation last spring, the FTC fined Twitter and modified that original consent decree to include even more requirements and very stringent protocols, um, even a third party uh, assessor who comes in and essentially audits things that they're doing. So that's sort of the background. And I think it's worth letting our listeners know that, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, Renato, because I know you handle cases with the, with the Federal Trade Commission. I mean, the Federal Trade Commission appears to have basically emerged as 
sort of the one body that is policing social media, um, which is, I think, otherwise largely unregulated, uh, you know, mainly because I think Congress doesn't really understand um, how social media works. And, you know, these uh, companies have a lot of influence and power. But the Federal Trade Commission, both through its antitrust division and also its consumer protection division have really been aggressive in, you know, looking at the practices of these social media companies. And especially with the new commissioner who was appointed under the Biden administration, Lena Khan, um, who is a very outspoken critic of the, the social media companies and how they uh, take advantage of users, um, they, I would say the eye of Sauron is really on these companies and especially Twitter and doubly, triply so because of this consent decree. In other words, they've already screwed up a couple of times. So this is where Elon Musk is when he, th this was a situation when he took over the company and he's basically now made it worse. Yeah, I think that's an important point to mention is that this was something that already was uh, hanging over Twitter before Elon Musk took over. And I think they paid a pretty huge fine, didn't they? I don't recall. Do you, what was the amount? Oh, it was my gosh. Very large. It's um, – I think it was $150 million. Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean that's very substantial fine. I know that folks listening at home are like, oh, that's chump change uh, to Elon Musk. And I will just say if somebody practices – uh, before regulatory agencies like that, that's a massive fine. That's the sort of thing you you can hire a lot of lawyers to uh, to uh, represent you and try to fight uh, if you know uh, for 150 million dollars. Let's just put and, it that way. So, and just to to <laughs> give some context on how high the FTC can go, um, in 2019 they fined Facebook five billion dollars for their misleading user agreement. Um, and you know how they were using users' data. So one fi 150 million is is really high I, I, based on your practice. But I think we need to note that they can go up from there as well. Yeah, no, and the FTC does a lot of different things. I should make that clear. They actually have a whole antitrust component um, where they review um, um, not only mergers, but they also uh, review anti-competitive practices in certain industries. So that's one very substantial piece of what they do. They do a lot of consumer protection work. When I was a federal prosecutor, I worked alongside the FTC and had a parallel in investigation with the FTC at one point. So they do a lot of important work. But I think for Elon Musk, I think you know, what, I, what I would highlight here is whenever you have a company that is operating under a consent decree. You know, you mentioned that's a court order. Really, it's an ongoing supervision of Twitter by this federal agency through the order of the federal court. So really, you know, what it means is that, you know, most companies can just do what they want to do, right? If we want to create a podcast, we'll create a podcast. We don't need to report into the FTC. We don't need to uh, get anyone to sign off. We're not worried about a court order coming down and, uh, you know, doing something for episode, you know, uh, modifying episode two of the podcast. But for Twitter, if you're introducing a new feature, for example, I mean, one thing that's really important in that consent decree is they say that I believe – um, Twitter has to provide 30 days notice to the FTC before um, you launching a new feature that would impact privacy or security. Well, Elon Musk was doing stuff left and right. I mean, totally transforming Twitter in a matter of hours, days. And I strongly suspect that he didn't write a bunch of uh, notices uh, and send them over to the FTC 30 days beforehand. Yeah, my reading of the consent decree is that Twitter is required to submit something called a privacy review within 30 days of launching a new product. And that review has like 14 different components where it goes through everything from what data they're collecting, who they're sharing it with, um, as well as safeguards that they're putting into place to prevent that data from being misused or uh, appropriated by people who shouldn't be. Um, it requires testing uh, to make sure that all of these safeguards are are working. So while the privacy review is required within 30 days, like obviously there's a, there should be 
a huge period before something gets rolled out, presumably, where all of these things are thought through, you know, and put together. I mean, I can imagine the testing itself uh, would would take a while. Um, and to your point, Renato, you know, yes, they've uh, they roll. I mean, I think Musk rolled his Twitter blue thing out in like two weeks, and the Washington Post reported that they did not go through the protocols that they need to um, in order to ensure compliance or to basically go through all of these elements of the privacy review. Um, and uh, this was uh, laid out, or at least some of the repercussions of this was laid out by a member of uh, Twitter's legal team, a former member of Twitter's legal team who, I guess, emailed employees on a Slack channel and basically said, look, you know, Twitter, if I think the quote is, if, if Twitter so much as sneezes, they need to, you know, provide notice um, and, and a review of some kind to the FTC. Uh, and this is clearly not not happening. And I think I would say, Renato, and I'm curious what you think, this has to be related to why the um, the data and privacy team, and I, I think I misspoke. I think earlier I said he fired them. Um, the, the data, he fired the legal counsel and the legal policy and compliance person, but the data and privacy team resigned. Um, so... Uh, I I did misspeak on that, but they resigned, and um, I would assume that that is related, probably, to what they see coming up on the horizon in terms of many of these violations. Yeah, that that's right. And in fact, there was a lot of discussion internally on Twitter Slack. At least that's what's been reported. Slack is sort of a communications uh, platform that a lot of companies use. So there's a lot of you know communications and discussion about potential potential personal liability, and I that's something I do want to mention because it comes up a lot in my practice. I represent a lot of um, companies and individuals that are um, interfacing with the government, sort of like how Twitter is, and dealing with you know government oversight, government investigations, things like that. And one real concern for all sorts of executives at companies right now is personal liability. And that's partly in the wake of the uh, criminal conviction last month of the man who was the chief information security officer, CISO, for Uber. Uh, and he, what happened there was essentially there was a data breach for Uber. Um, and there, there had been previous data breaches. But when this one happened, uh, he made a decision to try to hide that, and he paid the hackers a hundred thousand dollars out of a program that they had for white hat hackers, like people who, you know, hack your company basically just to find a vulnerability and they leave a trail so that it's uh, obvious so you can fix the problem. Uh, something that a you know, program that was meant to reward them, he actually used that money to um, pay off these black hat hackers, and then tried to hide that from the rest of the company. Um, there was some evidence that the um, uh, uh, that uh, the DOJ pointed to to suggest that the CEO at the time might have known. But in any event, when the FTC was answering, um, you know, filing reports and answering interrogatories and there was written testimony, they hid all that. And so this uh, gentleman actually Sullivan actually uh, ended up uh, being uh, indicted and then convicted of obstruction of justice and what's called misprision of a felony for actively concealing this from the FTC. So now uh, every executive, all these folks that I work with, whether they're in-house counsels or compliance officers, are freaking out that they're going to be the next one to go to prison if they uh, hide something from the FTC or some other government agency, SEC or whatever. And so accordingly, everyone's super careful right now. And uh, that, I suspect, was inspiring uh, all of these folks inside Twitter to be like, you know what? I am not going to prison. I have other potential employment. I'm going to just exit now uh, and get a job as a CCO or a CISO elsewhere. Yeah. And I mean, listen, uh, according to the consent decree, some of those people would have to basically file a certification that Twitter was in compliance, sort of this annual blanket you know, statement. I personally wouldn't sign my name to something like that to a federal agency unless I was absolutely sure. And if things are happening so fast or corners are being cut, um, you know, that that is potentially a false statement. And I think to your point with the Uber example, 
I mean, FTC has civil enforcement power, but they do partner with the Department of Justice uh, and bring in law enforcement if there are criminal violations. And it sounds like they clearly are ready to do that. Um, And I think that that's partly why, you know, as you noted, people must be very nervous. It sounds like, again, from this uh, letter that this former lawyer wrote on the Slack channel, that Musk is pressuring or or suggesting that the engineers self-certify as they create these products. Now, look, I haven't worked in a tech company. Maybe that's possible. I mean, I looked at that consent decree. It does not seem to me that a rank and file line engineer who's working on maybe some aspect of a final product would be able to certify all of those things. So many of those things you know, require a bird's eye view of the company or are more legal in nature, not necessarily technical. Um, and he was all they were also apparently assured by Musk's lawyer that they wouldn't be they wouldn't face any kind of criminal liability to the extent that Twitter was ended up being found in violation of this consent decree. Um, and you noted, Renato, in a in a good t- Twitter thread that um, or Twitter post that these employees would be wise to be circumspect about this legal advice. Yeah. So because Twitter doesn't have a head of legal, my understanding is, or at least it appears from the reporting, is that Musk's personal attorney, who's I'm sure a very good attorney, but he is acting right now in, you know, or, or sort of stepping in the shoes and trying to act as the representative or the legal uh, counsel for Twitter. But his lawyer, you know, his legal representation is actually for Elon Musk, not for Twitter. And ultimately, a lawyer represents a client. And I actually think it's not appropriate for him to be offering legal advice to these employees when he, you know, as far as I can understand, he represents Musk personally. So I would be very circumspect um, if I was one of those employees regarding that legal advice. And, uh, you know, frankly, you know, most um, most of the time when there's a disclosure made to a government agency, it's very carefully vetted, both by an in-house team and by outside counsel. And that's part of what I do uh, for clients. I do all sorts of different things, but that's certainly a piece of it. And so, you know, if when, a, you know, like you said, like an engineer, they, they have no idea. They, that's not their thing is dealing with the FTC or dealing with lawyers or making filings to a federal agency. They're relying on that team in place. And without that team there, I think they have every reason to be concerned. And and I will just say as well, you know, you, you know, you know, you had mentioned, um, you know, uh, the you, a little bit about the FTC. One thing I will say is this is also an area where elections matter. You know, a lot of times folks are saying, well, where's the accountability and this and that. I will say as somebody who currently represents clients who interface with the FTC in an investigation, um, that there is definitely a shift there uh, with the Biden administration. I think they're more aggressive. And that, I think, underscores for folks inside Twitter the potential danger and I think that's why we're seeing so many uh, Twitter employees voluntarily exit. Yeah. And given that they won't be launching an investigation from scratch, I mean, at this point, if you know the, the rules are set forth, it's pretty clear if you know Twitter is complying with it or not. And it sounds like the FTC could bring an enforcement action pretty quickly. Um, you know, they're not just digging in the dark to figure out if if Twitter has done something wrong. And they, they can go back and basically allege that Twitter is in violation. And I assume Twitter would have to, the onus would be on them to, to show that they're not. And at that point, I don't know who would show up because they seem to be dwindling in their employees. So <laughs> must personal lawyers, I'm sure, would be the ones handling it. Yeah, I, I got to say, that's one thing, you know, a lot of our listeners, Asha, have gotten a sense of how long investigations can take and legal processes can take, you know, in many ways, having that consent decree in in place allows you to kind of skip to the front of the line. You know, it's like, you know, Monopoly where it's like, you know, go directly to, to, uh, you know, free parking or go or whatever. You just go right that, you know, right there. So here it's like you already have a consent decree. There's already rules in place. 
Um, and they could just go right to that judge and say, judge, they are violating your court order. And the judge could immediately consider that issue right then and there, uh, as opposed to having some sort of fulsome investigation from scratch. So I, I like you said, I think very significant issues for Mr. Musk. He's taking on, you know, there was this comment from his personal attorney that, you know, he sends rockets to the moon. So he doesn't, you know, he takes on all sorts of risk and this and that. I, look, great client to have if you're a lawyer, private private practice. I'm sure that 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 uh, that his lawyers are are happy to bill lots of hours figuring out these problems. But if you're an employee uh, or for those of us who actually, I, I don't know about you, uh, Asha, but for me, I'm actually it, Twitter. Something I actually care about because it's it's provided a really great um, avenue and and created helped us create a great community there. Um, I think for all the rest of us, this has just been nothing but a lot of downside. Yeah, and though my question to you, Renato, is if he's just running this into the ground. I mean, look, if if the FTC does try to enforce this, and let's say they do decide to do what they did with Facebook and say, look, this is a thir- three strikes and you're out situation where we're going to fine you billions of dollars, which would essentially send the company into bankruptcy. Can they force him to divest from the company and put it under some kind of stewardship? I mean, because there, this does have a lot of impact on the public, right? Like Twitter just shutting down tomorrow would not I mean, I guess, you know, it, it could be so good in some ways in terms of um, adding more free time to my day and, and to many people. But is, is that what are their options, I guess, as we wrap up this segment, like in terms of what could potentially happen? Well, wow. in this context, I would be very surprised if something like that happened. It does happen in certain circumstances. You know, I when I was back when I was doing joint, you know, or I would say joint, but uh, parallel investigations at the FTC when I was at DOJ, you know, there would actually be companies placed into receivership and, you know, they would take them over because the companies were just frauds uh, and doing, you know, basically criminal enterprises of some kind or another. Um, in this con- context, what I would expect is more teeth, more enforcement, more oversight um, by the court. I mean, they already have a court order in place. They could just keep like they've done when there's prior violations, issue large fines, um, you know, add additional requirements, modify the consent decree, extend the the amount of time that the consent decree will be supervising Twitter because there's still some some years to go there. So I think. You know, that's the that's what I would expect as a next step. And that's the sort of thing that somebody who is a prudent, uh, you know, business owner uh, would be very concerned about. I don't know what that means for Mr. Musk. I don't really know where he falls in that spectrum. But if it was my company or your company, that would be something we'd very be very concerned about. So stay tuned, I guess, to see what happens. Indeed. <laughs> So, Renato, I have a confession to make. When anyone mentions the word crypto, my eyes glaze over and I start getting very sleepy and I either exit the conversation or find something else to do. Um, And so initially, when I saw this whole emerging scandal about FTX and I saw that it was some crypto bro I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I can't, uh, I, I don't have time for this. But it's actually kind of sexy. Um, reminds me a little bit about of Theranos. But I would love to break down exactly what's happening because even apart from the whole crypto aspect, um, it has all the makings of, you know, sort of the the financial frauds that we have come to know and love. It is a huge one. Uh, and I'll just say, if you're somebody who isn't interested in uh, crypto at all, um, first of all, this is interesting. I think for a lot of people, this is getting them interested. And it's probably not the best uh, intro because I think it gives you a perspective in the industry. We could talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute once I give the background, because I think that the whole industry, because I do I do work uh, with folks in this industry and I do a lot you know, in the sort of space of, of people who are doing um, financial trading and investments. Um, there's a lot of people who are really concerned that this is how the government's going to view the whole industry. And I do think it's actually going to have an impact on how regulators look at this space. 
But but Bankman, Mister. So this is all about Sam Bankman Fried and FTX. Sam Bankman Fried is sort of the super young, uh, way younger than us, a genius supposedly who people thought was going to be the world's first trillionaire. Uh, everyone thought that this guy. I mean, I went to conferences where this guy was a featured speaker, and he was just the new genius who was going to save us all. That sort of thing. He created FTX, which was um, it's a crypto exchange. And as of maybe a couple of weeks ago, it was one of the largest in the world. I think it was maybe the third largest in the world. And what and that means and, just to like I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna jump in and ask you to clarify. So he there was a cryptocurrency called FTT, and this crypto exchange is where people could buy and sell that cryptocurrency. They could buy and sell multiple, all okay. sorts of cryptocurrency. So like ones that you've probably heard of, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, you could trade on FTX. So FTX, an exchange, is where you know you put your money in uh, and you'll have an account and you could trade. If I want to, you know, if I think Bitcoin is going to make money uh, and go up in price, I could buy it or I could sell it. Uh, or I could buy it and sell it rapidly, you know, based, you know, try to ride the waves of it going up and down and try to make money, you know, as the price goes up and down, just like people do with stocks or futures or options or bonds or things like that. Um, and so that was FTX's business. But you mentioned FTT is a particular kind of, you know, crypto offering they had. It was a coin, a specific token that they had. And what FTX required is that when you're paying your transaction fees, so if you if you have a trade on an exchange, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or whatever, you actually pay a small fee. To, and that's how they make money on every transaction. So what FTX said is if you want to pay our fees, you have to pay them in FTT, which is their special token. Why? That's a good question. But that is actually part of this part of this saga and part of the fraud that occurred or allegedly um, occurred here. Because what happened, I think, is at a certain point, there was there was news articles that came out that suggested that FTX did not have the amount of money uh, uh, you know, available to actually cover the customer money. It had billions and billions of dollars of, of customer money that had been deposited at FTX for use in trading. But it was not actually available. So, you know, if you deposit your money into your uh, bank account, it's actually insured by the federal government, the FDIC. And regardless, I think we all have an expectation that if I go to my Citibank account, and I want to withdraw my money that's in my savings account. It's going to be there. Similarly, when you go to an exchange, if you put in a million dollars, you want to trade, your expectation is you can withdraw your million dollars. Um, once that article came out, a lot of people started trying to withdraw their money. Uh, FTX did not have uh, the funds available to do that, uh, to provide that money back. And it started a run on the company that actually caused another large exchange called Binance to come in as like a, I wouldn't say a white knight, but to come in and consider investing in and taking over FTX. They did their due diligence and they're like, uh, no, uh, we're not interested, which sent very big concerning alarm bells and ultimately caused things to unravel. And there's as as news has come out, it's become apparent that there are multiple very significant potential fraud, fraudulent schemes that are that are. Yeah. Afoot. So let's let's break that down. So my understanding was that. Um, the um, what's his name again, Mister Bankman, Bankman Free? free. SBF. Like, okay. SBF. I, was, I kept wanting to say Sigmund Free. So anyway, Bankman Freed, um, he was criticizing the head of Binance. Um, I think he was like, I don't know, saying bad things about him behind his back, or it was a rival exchange, Binance, right? And so right. that person, um, Zhao, I think is his name. Uh, he held a lot of FTT tokens at FTX and basically on Twitter said, you know what? Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm going to withdraw all of my FTT. <laughs> and basically, and he, he held so much and his followers were like, oh my God, if he's withdrawing, then we're going to withdraw too. And that's what caused the run on, um, on uh, FTX, but 
the to the extent that the about the fraud and why that money wasn't there to cover all of that. For one thing, I should note this this industry is not regulated, is it? I mean, that's the whole point. Uh, or at least, is are they moving in that direction? I, I for people, by the way, listeners who are like me and you know, don't understand crypto, I have to recommend um, a Nova episode, which I think just came out this week or last week, and it's called Decoding Crypto. It was super helpful to break this down. Um, and, you know, kind of talking about how crypto started conceptually as a currency, it's basically become an asset, um, you know, it, it and I guess sort of operates as both. But um, that was really helpful. But the whole point of cryptocurrency is that you eliminate like government and the middleman and all of this kind of stuff. So um, where does the government come in? I mean, are, are these investors or people who had money in this exchange just screwed? Yeah, so the answer is no. And there's actually, unfortunately for Mr. Bankman Fried, even more victims that we haven't even yeah. discussed. <laughs> or alleged supposed victims, maybe, you know, whatever, apparent victims, or whatever euphemism you want to use. But getting to the regulation point, um, I actually, this is something that I go around giving talks about uh, in my uh, primary job uh, about, you know, where, who's regulating crypto and where that's going to go. Because right now there's a real question regarding whether the SEC or uh, entity called the CFTC that I do a lot in front of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission will ultimately be the primary regulator of crypto. Um, the CFTC would like to uh, be the primary regulator of crypto. They have declared that all um, that all uh, crypto is a commodity. Um, but um, Mr. Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, has also, I think, you know, been very um, enthusiastic about having a role in regulating crypto. I don't know if you remember, but when Kim Kardashian had a, was the subject of a recent SEC order for promoting crypto in a way that the SEC believed was misleading. Um, you know, Gary Gensler did like a video for social media and like it was like his face and a bunch of cartoons and stuff like really trying to promote, you know, the fact that the SEC was regulating. So there's been a big question, but, you know, that refers to the um, I would say the sort of nuts and bolts regulations of how you know, how an exchange operates and how issuers of tokens would have to, to do that. But that does not have that. Uh, there's no question regarding, let's say, anti-fraud in um, I I I regulation. In other words, if you are defrauding people, whether it's like with tulip bulbs, baseball cards um, or crypto, and you, and you are doing that in the United States of America, first of all, it very well may be a crime in the United States Department of Justice is going to come and get you. Because one thing I will mention, Mr. Bankman Fried's company was headquartered in the Bahamas. And a lot of crypto companies have are, are headquartered elsewhere and then have small U.S. affiliates, um, essentially. But that doesn't if you're defrauding people in the U.S., that's a crime. And similarly, the SEC and or the CFTC um, will have anti-fraud jurisdiction. And the question is just whether or not crypto is a security. Uh, and if it's not a security, ultimately the CFTC would be the ones with the anti-fraud jurisdiction on the civil side. But frankly, Mr. Bankman Freed at this point would be very lucky to just have a regulatory problem where he pays a massive fine or loses his company. Uh, I think he has to be very concerned about federal prison because there's a whole bunch of things going on here. So let's get to the fraud part. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So tell me if uh, th this is, if I have this right. Uh, Mr. Brankman Fried also had another company called Alameda Research. And Correct. this was also, this was a trading firm, not for cryptocurrency, I think, but for something. It was a hedge fund. Okay. It was a hedge fund. Um, yep. Alameda Research, this is where it gets, you know, sexy and kind of weirdly Theranos like was headed by a woman or run by a woman with whom he also had an on and off romantic relationship. True. Okay. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's some conflicts of interest uh, going on there. Anyway, um, Alameda Research, for some reason, got ran into financial trouble. And maybe you can, I don't know if that's 
you know, the details of that. But that's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah for sure. But basically, then FTX lent billions of dollars to Alameda Research to basically cover that those financial shortfalls or, or expenses or whatever they had. And that is related to why is is or maybe I'll ask the question, is that why those funds were not available when people went to get their deposits back? It's part of the reason. And that's a big problem, by the way, because so just to break it down here, what fraud is, is when you lie to people to get their money. Okay. Just to keep it very simple for people. <laughs> and FTX said to its customers, it, it's ironclad in the agreement that your money will be there and it will only be used for your, these specific uses. And so it's lying to you. If it, if they're telling, if FTX and he's causing this to happen, if he's telling you, don't worry, your money's going to be sitting here waiting for you to trade with it. And instead it's being used to prop up his hedge fund. Now, the pro, uh, separate, separate problem for him is that the people who are investing in this hedge fund were investing in this hedge fund because they were going to do some super keen things to make a lot of money, right? The reason you invest in a hedge fund is because you think these hedge fund whiz kids are going to take that money and invest it in all sorts of fantastic ways to make a profit for you with your money. Otherwise, you could just invest it yourself, right? Put it in a, a bonds or a bank account or trade stocks or whatever. So you're giving it to them because they're they they're going to do something great with your money. But what the what he was what Alameda was doing was they were taking a large portion of the money that the hedge fund investors did and they were buying FTT to prop up the value of FTT. Um, so essentially, that's just like totally there. He was yeah, defrauding like both a, ends. It's like a circular Ponzi scheme. Basically. So FTT's value, under, I think everyone can understand why that why he would want that to be high, because that's how he's getting paid for all the transactions in FTX. And he has a so he has a very significant financial stake in FTT. But if you're in a hedge fund, you're like, why the heck are we investing all this money in FTT? So the the way that the I, I, I suspect federal prosecutors and uh, regulators would view this is you weren't actually investing in FTT to as an amazing investment for these people. You were using this money to prop up your other business, which is not what you told those investors you were going to be doing. Yeah. And he had many. Um, private investors, I guess, in FTX, but didn't have any of those people on the board. I mean, it sounds like the board oversight at FTX, and I assume also at Alameda, was not particularly robust or effective. Yeah, he was definitely one of these, like, you know, people thought he was some sort of visionary. And so, ever, you know, it was like, trust me, trust me, trust me. It's almost like Bernie Madoff in that regard. Like, everyone's, yeah, he was a big name and people trusted him. But, you know, he – one thing about Mr. Bankman Freed is he's been going around making a lot of statements um, since this all happened, which is really something very bad move. But, you know, there was a, a Financial Times article that had an embedded Google spreadsheet that Mr. Bankman Freed allegedly or reportedly created in which he gave his thoughts about all of – where all the money was and what his thoughts were <laughs> regarding all of this and – you know, it just appeared like literally this guy understood that there wasn't enough money around and he was personally just sort of, you know, moving money between various accounts and entities. Uh, I mean, I, I it, it's his best defense is going to be he had no idea what he was doing. I mean, that I think is going to be his argument is that he's such an idiot. Um, but the problem is he's built himself as some sort of brilliant visionary. It's going to be hard uh, to suddenly switch gears and say that he was just so ignorant that he had no idea what what he was real what, what the significance of this was yeah he's the kid of stanford professors like he's not you know like he doesn't seem like a dummy um yeah he's somebody that it, to give listeners an idea it's like you know how steve jobs everyone was holding this guy up like he was some sort of genius maybe he, i'm sure he was he was a brilliant business person some people believe that about Elon Musk. I, I don't think you and I maybe are. Elizabeth that, Holmes know. also. Yeah, there you go. And as you say, Theranos, right? Like she was also like, oh, she's some sort of whiz kid. That's kind of how things are with, with Mr. Bankman Freed. He was some visionary. And like I said, I'd go to these financial conferences. And I, I, I wasn't going to crypto conferences. I would go to like mainstream, like 
securities, commodities sort of conferences. And they're like, hey, this guy is a big deal. And, you know, this is the future of, you know, co you know, commodities. This is the future of securities, whatever is going to be this guy in crypto exchanges like his. And, you know, so it's going to be really hard for him to say, yep, you know, you're billing yourself out as some sort of amazing visionary, but actually you're a bumbling fool who had no idea that you shouldn't be moving money around and making promises that, that you knew you weren't keeping and that sort of thing. What are next steps? Like, what can we expect? Like, this is a situation where they're just starting to investigate, I assume. So what does a timeline look like here, though? He, as you noted, is like blabbing and interviews like yeah i guess that was a bad move so giving billy like i mean he's kind of confessing to a lot of what he uh i suspect would be relevant to the fraud um what do we what do we think yeah although it's self-serving because you know I, I somebody's tried a lot of fraud cases usually the defense is i'm a bumbler uh i made some mistakes I just was inattentive and that's kind yeah. of where he's going. Like, I'm so sorry this all happened. And, you know, I'm not an intentional fraudster. I'm just a bumbling fool. Um, but yeah, he, he's definitely digging himself into a hole. So there's a bankruptcy proceeding that they've started. So that's sort of ongoing, but that's going to overlay with uh, I, what's reportedly, I think the wall street journal reported there's DOJ mm -hmm. and sec investigation. So I would expect, um, you know, I would expect at some point uh, in the not too distant future for them to take aggressive action. It's going to take quite a bit of time to get on top of this. I mean, everyone who's you know wondering why it takes so long to investigate Trump or some of these other cases, like it, this is really complicated. This can be a multi-billion-dollar fraud potentially. So, uh, one of the largest in U.S. history, uh, if all the reports are correct. And so. It's going to take some time, but they also have some urgency to make sure that whatever assets are there Preserve. are, you know, maintained and not uh, squirreled away or just or you know, wasted because, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential victims who are going to be looking for their money back. OK, last question. Who do you think will play Mr. Bankman Freed in the movie? <laughs> Jonah Hill. Is that is, is that is that a good answer? I think he needs better. He needs some hair. He needs some hair extensions. Yeah, maybe. we need. To, yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm not really sure. Um, I don't know who the hip young actors are right now, but you know this is going to be a movie. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah, I think it's more movie than miniseries. Uh, but that's another possibility. Like you know, you could imagine your HBO miniseries on uh, on Mr. Bankman Freed and his. In you know his on again off again love affair with the head of Alameda, I don't know who would play her. <laughs> awesome. So Asha, before we go, uh, I noticed that you finally have your cat and you have a name for your cat. A little different than I expected, though. So what is the cat's name? The cat's name is Pancake. And I named him Pancake because when he arrived, he was really scared. And basically, he flattened himself out and smushed himself under the couch. And that's what he, he would periodically come out. And then as soon as he saw a human, he would flatten himself out and go back under. Um, he did that for about 24 hours. And now now he's like splayed out with his, you know, legs and tummy exposed or whatever. So he's he's fine now. But at first, it he was doing that and i called it paint i was like he's pancaked under the couch again and so we decided to go with pancake and we is you and your kids is that yeah is me and my daughter really okay i have to say i'm a little disappointed because in our last episode you indicated that this is going to be an indian snack food i know there are a lot of great indian snack foods ash i'm kind of disappointed i pancake? know I, mean, I have i feel like i've let my people down um but I did consider dosa mm -hmm. as an alternative. That would have been great. Honestly, like a pancake just fit. And sometimes, okay. you know, sometimes the pets pick the name, you know, or they, they create the name and you just have to go with it. I guess, you know, papadam or flat, non is flat. I mean, come on. Uh, but anyway, okay. Uh, oh, pa pancake it is. And it sounds like he's adjusting really well. He's very, very cute. Yes, he's very cute. He's and not. He is in our cute. video promo for the YouTube version, which is 
finally uh, getting up on our YouTube channel. So that's that's all happening. Yeah, it's happening. I think we have to explain one more thing because I we've gotten a few questions about this why we were talking about steam mops. Yes, my wife was one of them. Like, what the hell is the steam? What are you talking about, steam mops? What does that have to do with anything? So. What is what the hell is your thing with steam mops, Sasha? Well, I've developed a bit of a reputation on Twitter uh, for being an aficionado of steam mops, which I discovered during COVID. And, you know, we were all trapped in our house and I had two kids and I had my old cat then and you have to clean. And I got a steam mop and it changed my life. And so I started tweeting about it and I basically earned like a pretty loyal following of people who started buying steam mops and, and agreed that it changed their life. So I um, appointed myself a steam mop influencer and that's that's sort of where the love of steam mops comes from. And I kind of did that jokingly. However, recently, a European company sent me a deluxe steam mop, what they called the Dyson of steam mops and asked me to test it. And just to bring this full circle with our initial segment, I'm glad that I wrote that piece uh, about Elon Musk and the FTC because in doing my research, I learned that the FTC has requirements for social media influencers, uh, disclosure requirements. So when I post my video testing the Deluxe Steam Mop, um, I know now that I have to disclose that the mop was given to me for free and that I'm basically, you know, that my endorsement, you know, is, are my own thoughts and, you know, but that, that was provided to me. I do not get any commission, however, from any sale of steam mops so far. I'm still waiting for big mop to really take me on. Yeah. As I say, so far, I mean, eventually we're going to have like the Asha branded co-branded steam. Mop, right? <laughs> yes. It will change. It won't life. be the Dyson of steam mops, but it's going to, it's going to be very cool. All right. Well, this is, I'm waiting. Uh, I'm awaiting your review of that steam mob that, okay. that maybe that'll be featured in our next episode. Excellent. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of It's Complicated. Please like and subscribe and also find our YouTube channel where you can catch us talking as well as our special guests and potentially a steam mop.